Welcome to the Leesburg Public Library virtually. Today's Florida History Lecture is presented by Julie Hauserman. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Julie. Oh, I'm Deb from the library, by the way. I'm the program coordinator here. <laughs> Julie Hauserman has been writing about Florida's environmental environment and politics for over three decades. Her most recent book is about a National Geographic explorer and Florida man who spent his life swimming inside the planet which is what we'll be learning about today. The biography Drawn to the Deep, The Remarkable Underwater Explorations of West Skiles won a 2019 National Outdoors Book Award for bi biography. She has twice been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, once for her stories about pollution in Florida's Fen Hollow River, and once for her stories about arsenic leaking out of pressure-treated lumber all over America. She won the Scripps Howard National Journalism Awards Top Environmental Prize for her work on the arsenic stories. Hauserman was a Capitol Bureau reporter for the St. Petersburg Times in Tallahassee and has been a commentator for National Public Radio's Weekend Edition Sunday and Minnesota's Public Radio's The Splendid Table. Her essays are featured in several Florida anthologies, including The Wild Hearts of Florida, the Book of the Everglades and Between Two Rivers. And she lives in Tallahassee. Welcome, Julie. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate everybody who's, who's uh, shown up to hear about uh, the adventures inside of our planet, which is something that uh, we really don't think about as we drive around uh, above ground, what's beneath us. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and hope everything works. Yeah, we look good. Is it? Can everyone see that? We good? Okay, great. So uh, Wes Skiles was a, uh, a Florida man born in Jacksonville who became one of the top photographers in the world by plying his trade of photography in a place with no light. Uh, it was completely pitch black. So basically what he did is paint with light inside of our planet. This was of course before digital photography before a lot of the flash photography and the, the innovations that we have now. It, these were really remarkable images that no one had ever seen before. And um, these cave divers, well, first of all, let me just tell you a little bit about, about the art of his photography. So this is in Walta, uh, which is a, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And you can see here, I start with this slide so you can see here Wes's incredible artistry which shows he lights all, all these different areas here and puts people in different foreground and background in order to show you the scope of something that is really almost impossible to imagine um, from above. So some of these, these, are, these are incredible works of art that might take expeditions that might last weeks and you know, involving repelling through, you know, going through the forest with equipment on the backs of burrows and repelling into holes and fording streams. And we'll get into more of that stuff later, but I wanted to show you uh, the type of work, just the breadth of the type of work that, that Wes did. He was a, um, I met Wes when I was a reporter uh, working on water quality issues and covering the springs and the changes that were happening in the springs when I worked for the St. Petersburg Times. Uh, notably, we tried to fight a dairy that was going in in High Springs, Florida, that was going to really pollute a lot of the underground resources below it. University Press of Florida, after West was, ki West was killed um, and at age 52 on a routine dive off of West Palm Beach. He was working for the uh, television program Nova, if you've ever seen that. He was filming some underwater footage for them. And something happened with his equipment, and he just was doing what he loved to do, and then he wasn't. So he drowned, but he didn't, um, you know, he probably lost oxygen. His oxygen sensor might've been bad, um, but he wasn't trapped in a cave like so many of the other people who do die cave diving. Um, he, he um, you know, cave divers go inside the planet in regions of the planet that is called karst, K-A-R-S-T. And that's the Swiss cheese, limestone, sinkholes, springs that we have in Florida. You know, Florida has more uh, freshwater springs than I think anywhere else on the planet. The store of freshwater here is vast and amazing and really under, under uh, publicized and under known resource. During his life, Wes went all over the world and photographed and explored over 500 miles of caves. 
He did expeditions for Discovery, for National Geographic, for Shark Week. He was buried alive. A shark went into his shark cage, a great white shark. Um, he survived seal bites. He survived um, being buried in, uh, in, in, inside these caves. He lost friends. He recovered bodies. He had an incredible, incredible life. He was also a very funny and very um, in incredible artist. And uh, I, was, I was really proud to know him. He did a lot of stuff for our springs. He was one of the first divers who came out of the springs and talked about what was wrong. These are very secretive people. They don't, it took me a long time to get their trust because uh, all people ever hear about cave divers is when they die. They never hear about the incredible explorations that they do that's really on the same level as a moon as, or any sort of outer space expedition, but it gives us information that's interplanetary rather than um, outer space. This is a, a famous photograph of Wes's. This is the tannin, this orange brown looking is the tannin waters of the Santa Fe River. And this is the spring water coming into um, Ginny Springs, which is just, which is in High Springs, Florida, which is just north of Gainesville. So this shows him the artistry, the amazing artistry that he had in photographing these things. I like to call these guys and women aquanauts um, because they, you know, they, they explore these realms that are that are uh, underwater and inside the planet. Um, this is an amazing shot that Wes did of Dipolder Spring, which is about 250 feet below the ground, um, which is very, very deep. Uh, you would enter like a dark water hole near Wikiwachi, Florida, in order to get into this. You would, of course, have no idea just looking at that, as in many of these springs, you would have no idea knowing what's underneath there, that there's a vast landscape uh, beneath it. 90% of Floridians get their drinking water from the aquifer, which is where these guys are swimming, these, these cave divers are swimming. Um, our aquifer has 36% of the, of the water in all five Great Lakes. So it's, it's an amazing, amazing resource. Um, you can see again here, like I was saying, this is how Wes would stage different people so that you get a sense of the scope of the place. Early um, innovations would be that he got aircraft landing lights to use those to light these dark spaces. They did their own homemade underwater housing for cameras. Um, they lost a lot of equipment because of the pressure of being beneath the earth. You know, be, you're, you're a football field down there. This is another shot that shows the artistry of, um, of, of Wes's work. You've, you've lit this diver's face. You've, you've lit behind him so you can see where he's coming from and you've, you've lit this. It looks as though all the, all the light is coming from this diver's light, but of course it's not. This shows he's swimming inside the, Flor the Florida aquifer. Uh, it probably in central Florida. This is the mole tribe and here's our hero, Wes Stiles. These are the, the cave divers that all worked together for many, many years to explore the uh, caves and springs of Florida. This piece, this uh, photograph was taken in the Bahamas Blue Holes, which is a really remarkable area beneath the Bahamas, which I'll get into a little bit more. Uh, as we talk about his adventures. And I'm gonna take you through some of the adventures that he had uh, around the world inside the planet. This is Wes as a little boy in a hole at a construction project. When I started this, pro when I started this project as a journalist, I assumed that these people had to wrestle down fear uh, to get inside of these places. Um, and everyone will tell me, oh, I would never do that. They always want to tell me how they would never, never do that. And it's interesting because if I think if I'd written a book about an astronaut or something, they would never say, oh, I would never go to the moon. But they feel like they needed to say, I would never do that. Um, I would never do it either. I'm not a cave diver, uh, but there's something visceral about it. And people have, have snorkeled over these areas and they, they sense that feeling and they, uh, they get really creeped out by it. What I found out in my reporting was that these folks actually enjoy it. They feel a sense of envelopment. They feel really uh, calm and collected and um, in the silence and in the embrace of Mother Earth. And Wes was one of those people. Once he saw a spring, he wanted to go inside of it. This is Wes at age 16. Um, by that point, he was a 
rescue diver for the sheriff's department. He was one of the top cave divers in the world. And he was going all over to recover body to recover bodies. Um, this is probably taken at Jenny Spring, north of High Springs, where he spent a lot of his diving career and worked there as a, a publicist and uh, helping manage the business. This is a picture of uh, one of the divers going into the aquifer. They used to joke that these were butt shots because that was all that you got of cave diving shots was somebody following another cave diver inside. But Wes tried to really change that up with his video and with his photography so that you got a sense of movement, so that you got a sense of air exploration with it. And that was really what his genius was as he did this work all over the world. And that's your drinking water. Say hello to your drinking water. <laughs> Sometimes they would knock on uh, the well casings of people's wells below their houses. This is Sheck Exley. He's one of the most famous cave divers in the world. He perished in a cave diving accident in Mexico. Wes was fortunate to just live near Sheck Exley. And he became uh, a mentor of Wes's and uh, I think is responsible for a lot of Wes's success in the world. Uh, Sheck Exley literally wrote the book on cave diving. They were trying desperately, these North Florida cave divers, to add levels of safety to cave diving because there was a lot of amateurs who were dying and they were really um, not doing things properly. You need a ton of red redundancy when you do this work, just like you would for any high level expedition, mountaineering or any of those things, because things go wrong. This is the mole tribe. They're walking along looking for holes to get into. I think this might be Little River Springs, but I'm not sure. There's so many. So these guys would drive around on the dirt roads and get to know locals and go to bars and buy people drinks to find out where there were sinkholes and where there were um, the different places to find. They called it cave booty, uh, like a pirate booty. So they could, who was the first one in there? When they go into the caves, they use line. Um, and they, they, they anchor it and then they follow this line in and out and then they would tie it off as far as they could go. And maybe another group might, fo might follow and try to make, see if the cave would go further than that. They call it, will the cave go? And they would measure the caves and map them by using rope that's knotted at, at, at precise intervals. Or this is the early, um, you know, every so many inches and that way they could map the caves. And then they moved on to these giant digital mappers that are probably now tiny little things. Um, but it was always a, a challenge to map these caves and figure out where they would go. The state um, still does not have a good grip on how the water moves underground, where it goes. Um, so these explorers really brought us some essential information about our number one drinking water supply. This is um, a great uh, picture of uh, the bedrock of Florida, which is really was part of Africa. It was part of the continent Pangaea. So they'll find all kinds of things inside here. Um, the limestone is made, you know, embedded. Lots of sea creatures are embedded in the limestone. They'll see ancient manatees called dugongs or camels, tapirs, T-A-P-I-R, the anteater-like things. Um, you know, we have over a thousand springs that pump out over 8 billion gallons of fresh water per day. Wes really liked these ant farm is what he called them, uh, compositions because it showed people the weight of the earth and above and below. So he would have really staged this photo. He would have known this area. He would have gone back with, an, with a model and look how he lit it, very beautifully lit it so that we could get the sense of adventure and excitement and mystery that you would find. Now, of course, if you're in here and you hit your flippers with the wrong thing, you'll silt out. You can see a little silt here and you forget which way's up and which way's down. And that's how people die when they do cave diving um, or they don't properly account for their air. Um, they get lost, things like that. You find that um, you have a lot less of that now than you used to. Uh, this is another picture of inside your drinking water, inside your bedrock. This is the Florida aquifer, uh, probably around High Springs. So they're, they're, they're going through these little restrictions 
so it's so crazy. Sometimes they will take off their oxygen, just wriggle through and then pull their oxygen behind them and put it back on in order to get to these restrictions. And this is how they find these incredibly gigantic caves and different passages and figure out how things connect with each other, how the springs connect with each other. It's interesting, you wouldn't realize how far away from a spring shed the inputs of pollutants and waters and runoff happens. For example, Lake City, Florida, up in the Panhandle, is the start of the Itchituckney cave system that goes all the way down to Branford, Florida, just north of Gainesville. This is one of the early cameras that Wes used. These things were huge. They had to be outfitted in such a way that they wouldn't crack under the intense amount of pressure. Um, I like to say that, I like to use that Ginger Rogers quote, what is it? Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did only backwards and in heels. So it's the same for Wes. He's not only being an expeditioneer and doing the exploring, he's having to film it all. He's having to film it. Sometimes he's carrying also um, still cameras and video. He's staging where the people are. So before an expedition, he would tell everyone would have a big meeting and he would draw out where he wanted everybody to go and how they were, how were they were supposed to move and he would light everything to the ability that he could to get the best documentary film and the best still photographs. And that's what made him one of the really valuable photographers in the world for this type of work. Here's another example where he's lit he especially lit this space. You wouldn't see that. You would just see, I mean, it's, it's, it's very technical how he did this. You can see in here, there's a little bit of the shimmer. That's actually the, um, that's actually the, um, the air bubbles that are on top of the cave from the exhalations of the diver. This is Wes with some of the early equipment. Um, you can see uh, how much equipment that you would need in order to, um, uh, do something like this. It's absolutely incredible. Um, redundant lights, redundant air tanks, redundant everything. I don't know why I'm seeing this. Do you guys have this? Can you see this over here? Okay. This is the boil at Ginny Springs. This is the water coming out of Mother Earth. And it's just Amazing. I mean, if you're there, it's actually bubbling. Absolutely amazing place. Um, I'll never forget the first time I went there. I was just blown away. This sp one spring at Jenny Springs puts out 262 million gallons a day. This is the fight of the current fight, or the site, the site of the current fight by Nestle bottling this water. Um, it has been bottled for many, many years. And they just recently uh, sought a permit to really ramp up the bottling. The bottling companies don't have to pay anything like a hundred bucks or something to the state in order to take this water. They pump it into tanker trucks and take it to their bottling companies where they sell it to people for so much more than you would pay for your tap water. And it's pretty much the same thing that is the tap water, although um, maybe sometimes a little more highly filtered. This is uh, mastodon bones in Wakulla Springs, just south of Tallahassee. Wakulla is um, an amazing, amazing spring. It's a state park. If you've never been there, it has a beautiful lodge you can stay in. This back here is the Aquazep scooters that they use to go faster and farther in the caves. They would go in and they would stage bottles, little caches of bottles, so that in case anybody got in trouble, they would be able to get to one of these caches of bottles. But they it recovered an entire mastodon skeleton in the bottom of Ocala. And it's, I believe, in the Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. Or that might be the one that was also recovered. I think it is. I think that's the one. So things are preserved in the springs. Uh, there's relics all over the world. There's a lot of Mayan relics in Mexico in the, in the sinkholes and caves. Um, there was a lot of sacrifice that went on to um, the spring gods in various areas. So you'll find all sorts of artifacts in there. This is a famous West Skiles photograph. This is Devil's, there's two springs next to each other, Devil's Ear and Devil's Eye on the Santa Fe River, which is littered with prehistoric relics all along the Santa Fe. It's a dark tandem river. If you went by this, it would just be black. 
but he's ha he's gone in and lit this on purpose. He staged someone here and he's put these divers here so that you get a sense of, of this wonderful window to the inner world. They see a lot of things in, um, inside the springs. This is Wes's son, Nate, uh, playing with a manatee. They, sometimes alligators will be in there, although not that much because they don't really like the cold spring water, but uh, Wes um, they punched an alligator in the nose to get it out of the way, eels, snakes, you name it. Um, I do want to take a moment here to talk a little bit about the process. I had access to Wes's, all of his films and documentaries, of course, and I tried to interview at least two or three people each who went on these expeditions. And then I also had access to his dive journals for his entire career. So I had a window into what he felt and did and, you know, on all the expeditions. And so that's how I know about him punching the alligator. This is at the Wakulla Springs expedition. This is an amazing expedition um, where uh, 20 explorers went in 1987 uh, to go 300 feet underground underneath the lodge there at Wakulla Springs. Um, and they, they faced a technical problem. And that is that um, it going 300 feet underground, you will get the bends, which is um, can cause nitrogen narcosis and uh, um, cause permanent injury to divers. So any of you who are divers know that you have to go in stages back up to the surface. The problem with a dive like this is you would have to spend um, 15 to 20 hours to decompress at various levels and the divers would get hypothermia. So this was a National Geographic expedition um, to plumb the, the amazing um, uh, tunnels off of Wakulla Springs. And so they built this, Rolex gave money to build this crazy habitat here where the divers could get in this thing and it was on winches and they could then, the last parts of their decompression, they could go inside this habitat where they could, they had a tube that sent down, uh, you know, food, they could read books, they could just chill out and breathe normally while they were uh, going back to the surface. This expedition was so big that the state park had to put new electrical power lines in to support this. When they tried to put this habitat in, the first thing that happened was it uh, fell and they, they had to retrieve it. It took weeks. They had to put the equivalent of six Toyota Camrys, I guess I figured out, uh, ballast, 12 tons of lead ballast on that thing to keep it um, from spewing upward in the incredible spring flow that is in Wakulla Springs. During this expedition, um, the first thing that they went into was a cave big enough to park a Boeing 747 in. It's right underneath the lodge. Um, they set a record during this expedition in 87 of going nearly a mile from where they went in to the spring. At this point, subsequent explorers have gone, I think, over three miles. And they're, they've gotten to the point of their tunnels that it's so small that they may start using um, equipment like they had on the Mars rover and um, some, you know, uh, remote equipment to do the additional things that divers can't get to. But that's such a cool shot because it shows the land as well. I just, I've always loved this shot. He's inside the beginning of the cave entrance. This is the divers hanging out in the habitat. They were so excited because they had a phone in there since it was a National Geographic. They had a landline that could reach all over the world, which was so unusual, you know, that you would have something like that. Um, one of the things they do is they read paperback books under there, and as long as they keep them in a plastic bag with spring water, the books don't deteriorate. And so they bring that. They also that the big innovation was the underwater Walkman CD players, so they could listen to music and read books while they were waiting, uh, de decompressing. A lot of times they just sleep. This is a really exciting uh, part of the book, and it's from a documentary called Ice Island. Um, this was um, one of the first dive expeditions ever into Antarctica. 
it was absolutely unheard of that someone would do a dive expedition into Antarctica. Um, but Wes was able to get National Geographic to agree to do it. And he did a documentary about it for a series that he worked for called The New Explorers that was hosted by Bill Curtis. Um, this is a picture of the boat. They did not have an icebreaker, which most people do. They had, they, the, the New Zealand captain that they had for this expedition said, well, the big boats break, but the little ones bob. Um, when we're talking about bobbing, they have to cross the Southern Ocean where the waves are as high as six story buildings. And it, it's just, it was an absolutely harrowing journey, which I detail in the book. I was lucky to have both the documentary and interview several people who are, who are aboard. Their destination was the B-15 iceberg, which was about as big as Connecticut. And it had broken off of the ice shelf. And this was early, you know, this is 2001. Uh, this kind of stuff is happening all the time now, sadly. But they wanted to go get on this iceberg. So that's what they, that's what they did. You can imagine the amount of equipment and food and people they had to get across the world. They started out in New Zealand. This is um, two of the divers on the expedition next to an iceberg. This is Wes being loaded down. Of course, he's got everything. He's got his camera. He's got his oxygen. He's got all these things. A crazy thing happened when they went below the iceberg. It turned out that there's incredible currents along the side of the iceberg that will absolutely suck you uh, away. And so they ended up having to hold on to and claw their way out. These ice fish have these little tiny holes in about finger sized in the iceberg, which they used to claw their way out of this current. Everyone was afraid that Wes was going to die because he would not let go of that high Sony high definition camera. This was a new type of a, a new high def, and it was essential for them to be able to do filming in that absolutely white on white landscape. But they did make it out. It's very harrowing. A crazy thing is that under the icebergs, they found a Dr. Seuss is the only way I can describe it, land of bright colors and interesting plants and uh, dayglow fish and dayglow jellyfish. And who knew that under an iceberg would be this amazingly productive and wild looking system. You know, a lot of times when they go deep beneath, there are specially adapted animals that are found nowhere else on earth, like blind crayfish, things that don't have never, never seen the light. So this was a big surprise to them that there would be a colorful world beneath what you would think would just be a dead ocean underneath an iceberg. At least I did. This is Wes. Look, he doesn't even have a hat on. He got hypothermia. He's focused on his art. I mean, your tears freeze there. It's, uh, you know, um, they pulled him back up. They got him warmed up. But this just shows like the daredevil nature of his, of his nature. And, you know, I, I do talk a little bit about why people do this. And it turns out that there are certain people who have different levels of different chemicals in their brain. And they are the people who are our explorers. They are the ones who would get on a boat in England and go across the see and not know or in Spain, you know, we've always had these people and they have a much higher tolerance for risk than other ordinary people. Wes was one of those people his whole life. This is um, in the Hualta cave system. If you remember, it's spelled H-U-A-L-T-A in the Yucatan. If you remember the first shot that I showed you of the huge blue dome, in order to get to that huge blue dome, they had, it's the deepest cave system ever explored. And they had to travel miles through the jungle. They had to rig ropes and pulleys. They had to repel into a limestone hole. They had to go past raging waterfalls like this. They went three quarter of a miles deep and two miles of line was laid in order to get to the spot where they began their dive. So this was a many, many weeks expedition, which I detail in the book. They had to pack everything in and everything out, including their own waste. They, before they um, got out, well, they lost, they lost a member on this expedition. Um, his name was Ian Rowland, and he was a Scottish explorer. 
he had diabetes and he didn't properly um, prepare. He had, a, he, had a, he had a diabetic incident in the cave. So they had to repeat all of what they did to get him out two miles through, you know, all of it up the pulleys out to a, a nearby village. An interesting side note is, I don't know if you remember the news story of a bunch of Boy Scouts in Thailand that were trapped in a cave. And one of the rescuers was Ian Rowland's son, the very fellow who had died on this expedition. His son, all these years later, rescued the, the, the kids in Thailand. There's a limited number of people who do this sort of work around the world. And uh, they kind of all have a network and kind of know one another, I found. Um, and they, you know, are sort of jetting around the globe, going into these holes and, 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 and trying to push these, they call it pushing the cave exploration. This is an incredible story that takes place in Australia. It's a mystical story. It's a scary story. It's a miraculous story, but you're going to have to get the book to read it. This is a great white shark that Wes photographed. Um, it's a crazy story that he went to, he was, uh, if you ever watched Shark Week on Discovery, he went to South Africa to photograph the great whites and film the great whites. And he bought a shark cage when he got there. And I guess the shark cage wasn't such a good shark cage because when Wes went overboard and into it, a great white went right through it. And he had film, he, which aired on Shark Week, from inside the mouth of a great white shark. He was able to beat this shark off with his camera, with his heavy camera. Everyone above on the deck of the boat thought that Wes had perished below and they were all hysterical and they popped up. Um, half of the film that he filmed there, he had put the film in the camera backwards and of course, back then, this is digital. You don't know until you've developed it, what you've got. He had to go back on his own dime and his own time and film the rest of it so that he would be seen as a reliable and professional photographer. He had to work on a fishing boat to make the, the fair. And um, this is difficult work. It's a lot of equipment. There's a lot of um, you know, concerns for your own life, but even just the business concerns of it are very difficult. And I go into some of that in the book of, of how that pressure weighed on him. This is super cool. This is a, actually, this is a submarine, but it has articulated arms and it's called a newt suit, N-E-W-T, and that's uh, named after the person who invented it. Um, you could walk on the bottom of the ocean with this. And Wes did a, if you, you know, one of the things you can look up on, on Google is the new explorers, which this was one of the episodes that Wes uh, walked along the bottom of the ocean in Vancouver, off of Vancouver Island to look at six gilled sharks, a very rare species. So he would be chumming the water with pieces of fish in order to get these, get, get a picture of these things. It's, very, it's a very cute part where they actually see this, this elusive creature. There's all the explorers on board are so excited. Wes had a lot of ideas about using these newt suits and walking from one continent to another or something like that. Um, they still are used, I believe, for bridge construction and uh, checking uh, underground ca underwater cables, things like that. But check out the new Explorers series on YouTube and you can see some of Wes's work, including this great Walking Among the Sharks uh, episode. Um, this is um, our Florida aquifer, and I'm using it to talk a little bit about his work that I think is most uh, most must see for Floridians. It's called Water's Journey. You can see it on YouTube. The first one was called Water's Journey, Hidden Rivers. And as I told you, most cave divers were secretive and didn't want to tell anybody where they were going because of concerns about trespassing and concerns about, you know, just, there was just a negative feeling about people just going out on somebody's ranch land and going in the, into a hole in the ground and disappearing. Wes began seeing in the late 80s changes in the springs, um, algae, things like that. And he was one of the first people who came up and said, there's something wrong down there. And he came to me at the St. Petersburg Times and I did a huge story about um, what was happening with the springs. Terrifyingly, what we found was that practices that had happened years and years ago 
um, were pumping out of the springs, nitrate levels, phosphorus levels from cattle, fertilizer, big ag basically, were pumping out of the springs. So they had seeped into the aquifer so long ago. They're able to age the spring water that comes out by using two markers. One is the atmospheric bomb testing of atomic bombs because the deposition went worldwide and refrigerants, the presence of refrigerants, CFCs, which were outlawed, but they went worldwide. So if they see those markers, they can determine the age of the water that comes out of each spring and it's decades old. Um, Wes became an advocate at this point and Water's Journey was his way. I mean, the first thing he did was he came out of the springs and he went to his local county commissioners and said, oh my gosh, you can't believe what's happening. And they didn't seem to care. And then he went to the water management district and he said, oh my God, what's happening? They didn't seem to care. And then he went to, you know, the, the DEP and they didn't seem to know what to do with him. And, you know, he eventually ended up on the Florida Springs task force with uh, Governor Jeb Bush, who I covered for the St. Petersburg Times, and, um, you know, tried to put together policies to try to protect the springs. To this day, we don't have decent springs protection. And Wes was continually frustrated. But this film, Water's Journey, he decided, well, forget it. I'm going to go for the next generation. So he wrote, did a documentary that was basically aimed at middle schoolers, although it works for politicians too. Um, and he showed for the first time what happens when you walk on the ground, what's beneath you. So they had two divers that went beneath them. They were holding a ferrite rod, which is detectable through rock. And they tracked them with a ferrite detector, with a homemade ferrite detector. And they went underneath the Sonny's barbecue. You know, we're going left to the salad bar and right to the door. They went under golf courses. They went under homes. And they showed in a very clear way what's at stake when you pour something on the ground and where it goes. Water's Journey, Hidden Rivers, that's the first one. It's a great, great documentary to watch. He did two more, one on the Everglades and one on the St. John's. Those were later funded by the state of Florida. So they're a little bit... Um, they're a little bit different, they're a little bit higher, but Water's Journey Hidden Rivers is my favorite because this concept of real time above ground and below ground is the thing that really, really impressed school children and anyone who watched it. And I think was really one of those education art pieces that spurred people on to work for Springs Protection. This is Wes near the end of his life, um, filming a rattlesnake in the Everglades, uh, Water's Journey. This is one of my favorite of his photographs. It's of Cypress Springs in the Western Panhandle. You can see there that you can't even see, it looks like the canoe's floating on air. Um, while most of the springs on the Eastern part of the state and central part of the state have gone green because of algae, there are still clear ones like this on the other side of the Apalachicola River from me in Tallahassee that are just clear as a bell. This is another picture from um, that time period where he was doing Water's Journey, Hidden Rivers, and it shows them inside our aquifer. This is Wes inside the Bahama Blue Holes. This was his last assignment. Um, he made the cover of National Geographic and had an inside pullout section, which is a very difficult thing to get. And um, he died before the magazine was published, but he did get a chance to see what we call the mock-ups of it. So he knew that he was gonna be on the cover. It's actually a picture of his son, Nate was on the cover. But this Bahama Blue Holes expedition was a very incredible thing. One thing they do, and they're still doing, they use these stalactites and stalagmites to like uh, look at climate data from the history of the world. It's kind of like tree rings and they've uncovered a lot of things by going underneath the Bahamas. This is the photograph, this is what considered one of the best photographers, photographs in the world. Um, it's in the Bahama Blues, it's, it's in the Bahama Blue Holes. It hangs on the photo department wall at the headquarters of National Geographic in Washington, DC. What he did was, this took months um, 
to put this photograph together. It's a triptych. So there's three photos stitched together and the lighting, the, 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 the positioning of these models, there's people behind here lighting there. I mean, he's just, it's an absolute amazing painting with light is the best way to describe it. And it really, it, he, and he did his favorite ant farm thing where he kept the bottom and the dark, the bottom and the top dark so that you get that real impression of what it's like to be inside the earth like that. Um, the photo editors there are still marvel at this, this image. It looks like something that you would make up, you know, but it's real. There's a lot of expeditions still going on in the Bahama Blue Holes. This is Wes near the end of his life. You know, he's got fancier, fancier equipment. This is him up, up top side on the Bahama Blue Holes. In order to get an image like that, you've got to have camps of people going through thorny bushes, getting bit to death by every kind of bug. It's boiling hot in the Bahamas. Um, so there was a lot of work involved in, in that expedition and, get, and documenting it. But this is Wes at the top of his game, probably a month before he, month or two before he passed away at the age of 52 off of Palm Beach. This is West Skiles Peacock Springs State Park. Um, it was named after him after his death. The cool thing about this park, it's near, um, it's not that far from Live Oak, Florida in the, in the Panhandle, um, near the Suwannee River. You can go along a trail and it'll tell you what's beneath you, which is what he always tried to do. An interesting thing about Peacock Springs is in uh, one of the diver books, they described thinking that there was an earthquake as they were diving there. And they were just panicked, thinking they were going to get, you know, trapped. But it was a train going overhead. So they were underneath the train. This is the last slide in the series. And um, this is Jenny Springs at dawn. And I like to end with this because you would never know all those things that I showed you are beneath in here. But all those caves and stuff that they photographed for all those years are beneath here. Wes would want um, all of us to remind our, our, our leaders and our neighbors about what's at stake with Florida's aquifer and um, to realize the treasure that we really have here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to learn about this bit of history and this quirky corner of the planet. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. If you hey, have that was fantastic. <laughs> thank you. I can tell there's so much more. Yes. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about the aquifer itself? I actually didn't know anything about any aquifer until I moved to Florida. Right. I still don't think I know anything about it. So yeah, you know, we're, we're essentially an old coral reef. So we have so many holes and, and we're riddled with holes and tunnels and things like that. And so most of the drinking water here comes from the aquifer um pumped up there's threats uh, some of the threats to it include they uh, the state keeps wanting to pump polluted things into it into these aquifer storage and recovery wells like that's one of the things that they're planning to do to clean up the agricultural waste at lake okeechobee um some industrial some sewage is pumped down there um in my estimation it's it's a really unwise idea to do that because this is the, the source of all of our fresh water um in more in further South Florida, and I forget where the dividing line is, there's a surficial, a surficial aquifer, which is a little bit more shallow than the Floridan. It's not Floridian, it's Floridan, which is the vast canyons that I'm showing you here. Okay. And um, in other places they use surface water, so the reservoirs, things like that, but that doesn't really go well here because you know it's so hot algae grows in them. And so we're, we really are reliant on this um, pumped up underground water. I thought you were mispronouncing Floridian. Right, I know, Floridan. Mm -hmm. Floridan aquifer, which is, Correct. what's the area, the geography that that covers? Well, at some point, it's, and I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember where the line is, but at some point, maybe a little south of where you are, you know, I'd have to look at a map. It, it, a, a lot of this information comes from the United States Geologic Survey. You can get a lot of information. Okay. Um, I have to admit that when I was researching the book, I did go down a lot of rabbit holes because I was so interested and I had kept having to remind myself, you're writing a biography, you know, and, um, but that was one of them was like, what? We were part of Africa. What? Where does this, you know, 
all the ge geology is fascinating of Florida. And I've witnessed myself some of these incredible fossils just sitting on the sides of springs in, the, in this area around Tallahassee. And I mean, one time I went to a uh, archeological dig in the Oscilla River near where I live and they pulled up a camel jawbone right when I was sitting there. Wow. Yeah, around here, uh, Leesburg area in um, Helena Run, which is a um, an old canal. There's what's called Bug Springs, and you can see the water pumping out. You can see the water pumping out in Venetian Gardens in Leesburg. Um, you can just see it, like it's coming yep. up from the earth, and it's nerve. It, it it really is just fascinating. Yes, but wow, what what we what I know that we don't know. Yeah. Um, one of the things that they discovered that West dis discovered, and as a theme of the book, is that there there are hidden rivers. Um, you know, the state assumes that if you pump, if you drop something on the ground, it goes out in a concentric circle, and that's how they permit things. And it's completely wrong. And they've it's been pointed out to them for 25 years that the, that the modeling is wrong, and you shouldn't base permits on it. These things will suck into a hole and go down a cavern and go into another area. And they the way they determine the besides explorers is they do dye testing. So they'll put a fluorescent, like a fluorescent green dye into a spring and then they'll wait for it to come to where they think it might come out. And that's how they track where these things go. Oh. And it's, it's, it's a mysterious and they need to revise the state model to properly permit things. Wow. Oh. I'm monopolizing the, the, uh, the question and answer session here. So if anybody has any questions, you can ask or put them in chat. In the meantime, we have the book. This is the book at cameras. Oh, that's gonna get a good, pretty good picture. It's currently checked out to me in the library, but I'm done with it. So if you would like to be next on the list to get this book, email me. And it's also for sale. Um, I think this is one of the books where I, you know, I need to add it to my personal library. So I will end up buying this. Thank you. Um, because it is probably one of the most unique things I've ever known. I did not know Wes Skiles. I'm I'm not familiar with him until I read your book. I, I sometimes I don't know where I've been. He, I say I sometimes say to people he's he's such a famous person, but a lot of people don't know about him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he worked with James Cameron, the film director. He did all kinds of stuff, but um, you know, he just was kind of a if you didn't know that world, I'm lucky I did get a chance to know him. And yeah, you know, his, his children are also amazing. His daughter, Tessa, is taking on this work. She's wow. Photographing. She does a lot of photographs of mermaids in the springs and underwater in the springs. And uh, she worked for a while for this Florida Springs Institute in High Springs. And um, yeah. Linda says this was fascinating. Yes, absolutely it was. Thank you, Linda. Amazing photography, my gosh, it's just mind blowing. Yeah, and I encourage you to, you know, get on YouTube and look for West Skiles. You can see some of the, you know, unfortunately we don't have a website with all the, the resources put together, but that's something that may happen. I mean, one of the, the challenges of this work was, um, wow, this is a film, you know, and that was the thing that was hardest for me as a writer, because I was like, what do I have to offer in words? This is a, this is a person who left a visual record of his life. What am I even doing writing it? <laughs> it took me a while to get my head around, how do I, how do I do this work? And so I decided that the thing that I could offer would be these behind the scenes um, descriptions of what it was like to get this work, because I don't know about you, but when I watch a documentary, I'm not thinking how they made it, but now I do. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted, you know, oh my gosh, I mean, I remember one of the divers that's in one of Wes's documentaries, they did a screening of it, and he was sitting with his daughter, and, you know, he's stuck on one side of a restriction, and she says, daddy, did you get out? <laughs> you know, so I, I, that's what I realized that I could, when I finally put my head around it, that's what I realized I could, I could get to it was, what is it, what is it like to be a documentarian? What is it, what, do, what does it take to do these types of expeditions? And once I did that, I just divided up his life by the by the various expeditions and made a big long timeline on paper and just sort of went from one and you know tried to try to do it that way. Some of it's not chronological, so that was a little tricky. Um, and also the weight of doing a biography of someone, 
is much bigger than I had imagined. Um, it's a huge, huge responsibility. And you wonder who, what would people say about you? What would they leave in? What would they leave out? Um, that was something I didn't count on. I did this work over five years. I had a regular job and I would go away on the weekends. And I had a, I had a teenager also. So I would go away on the weekends and I would find a place near water, a little cottage or whatever. And I would do the work on the weekends. Wow. I was lucky because everybody was close by. I didn't have to travel much. So yeah, you're in the area. Yeah. Yeah. I got to spend a lot of time in the Springs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much for um, caring enough to want to learn more. Absolutely. I look forward to seeing more of your writing. I'll be looking it up. Thank, Thank you, you everybody for joining. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody. You too, bye.